we have winter and summer and we have ups and downs mm -hmm. and we have, you know, ebb and flow and we have, so, and in work for me, it's like that. And I think when you're an artist, which you are, I think when you're a storyteller and you're craving to build those connections, it's not about being in balance every day. I think it's maybe being from a balanced self within creating whatever it is that needs to be created and it means sometimes no sleep and it means sometimes within you know traveling and and, and building connections to people you know dancing until three in the morning and sleeping three hours which i do when i go to conventions because that's what matters at that point From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the Storytellers Network. I am your host, Dan Moyle, and I'm so excited that you are here for this episode. We're going to dive in with a great storyteller into an amazing story. I'm so happy for this one. Uh, before we do, a quick reminder that everything you need, past episodes and interviews, resources to help you tell your story better, it's all at thestorytellersnetwork.com. So wherever you're listening, Apple Podcasts or Google or Stitcher or Spotify, you can go to thestorytellersnetwork.com and check out everything you need to be a better storyteller. I know I can use all the help that I can get, so I hope you find some help there. Now, today's guest, I actually heard about through reading Jay Bear's Talk Triggers and reached out to her and said, hey, would you mind telling your story? Because I just loved the idea of this whole thing. So she, is, uh, she creates meaningful marketing with campaigns such as A Room with a Zoo, Zoo of Life, and Kaimook. Her name is Anya Stas, and she's an award-winning marketer with a passion for the possible, bridging ecology and economics. And it's really cool. We have such a great conversation. She dives deep into what moves her, into what, what story is for her. She works right now for the Flanders Meeting and Convention Center of Antwerp, which is basically the Antwerp Zoo in Belgium, but it's so much more than just a zoo, and it's so much more than just a convention center. There's such a great story here, and we get into that in today's conversation. So without further ado, let's get to the stories. So Anya, welcome to the show. I appreciate you taking time to talk to the storytellers in my network. So uh, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. So Anya, I heard, uh, as I said in my intro, I heard about you through Jay Bear's book, Talk Triggers. So let's talk a little bit about what you do. Your, your bios say you're an award-winning marketer. So I assume you consider yourself a storyteller? Yes, I do. Yeah? Yes, I do. Because I'm a connector. I connect people and I connect people through stories. Because I think nowadays, even as a marketeer, it's not just about enhancing the features and benefits of your product. You reframe it mm -hmm. in a way that benefits people's lives. And you do that best and most effectively through stories, because stories engage emotionally. They, re they really do connect us, don't they? They, they cross lines and everything. Yes, so if you're, if you're telling stories, uh, let's, let's tell the story a little bit about this room with a zoo, this convention center that's so much more, this zoo that's so much more. How do you connect that entity with people who can use it? Tell me a little bit about the story of the room with a zoo. So there you have a, um, a zoo, which is the oldest scientific zoo in the world. It's the third oldest zoo after uh, first London and uh, Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And this 175 year old institution has had um, events and people gathering since the beginning, because it was a sort of a country club. It was a gathering place for the well-to-do in the city. It was 70 years, seven zero, a private club. Hmm. That was typical of the 19th century city zoos. And so very soon in those early days, people felt a need to gather more formally. So they built a, what they called a salle des fêtes, which was a festive hall, a hall for feasts, for parties, for events, for more formal get-togethers. A concert hall was built as well. And so when we decided to um, 
renovate our concert hall um, a couple of years ago, which would have been the third version of our concert hall. Um, we also decided together with the city that this is the perfect spot because it's also adjacent to the railway station, to the Central International Railway Station, um, to add on 30 breakout rooms so that it would also become the International Convention Center for the city. So you have a zoo with event facilities and a concert hall, which date back over 100 years, mm. totally renovated and totally rebuilt anew uh, with 30 breakout rooms so that it become an International Convention Center. So it's one big gathering place in the city center adjacent to the central station, 15 minutes from the water, um, from the old city center. Um, and all those functions come together, which makes it very unique, especially also not just a zoo with the animals, but the fact that it is a beautiful, beautiful garden, um, botanical garden, which we know now from scientific research, that nature actually increases the cognitive abilities and helps people to retain information, actually helps people to connect on a deeper level and helps you do all the things that are necessary when you meet life. So those functions have really over time organically um, come together and are more relevant than ever today. So it was just for us, is what storytellers do, I guess, connecting the dots, mm -hmm. you know, looking at, the benefits that your product, that your place, that your service, that your experience has and build a story around it. And so obviously you're a great storyteller because I'm enthralled by this. And I love the idea that you go back almost 200 years to where they were doing this. And now 200 years later, we're doing it again. Just what a great story. Where does, where does your story, Anya, start as a storyteller? Did you always kind of just tell stories or did you have to develop the skill over time? I think it's both, um, for me at least. Um, I was in my family. I was the one with the with the voice, with the word. Um, there was the journalist, and there were the sportsman, and there was the musician, and I was the one who studied theater and and poetry classes and rhetoric and and dictation, and I would be the one who would. Uh, um, you know, be her um, poetry would be read out loud in class or when we had to make essays, it would be read out loud in class. I mean, even in music school, when I would have an essay about Beethoven, it would be read out loud. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize it then, but looking back on it, I guess it was some, somehow always there. And I've always been interested in stories and, and writing and, and just m mostly um, connecting. I think I'm a connector looking back. It's just connecting people, bringing people together, connecting for myself the dots in my life, finding sense in things and, and events, mm -hmm. and finding the red thread. Uh, but that's also what I do in, in my job. I think that's what puts me aside and, and, and is sort of my signature as a marketer or as a communicator or as a PR person is um, to connect, you know, in your product to connect things, mm -hmm. you know, that make sense and weave them into a different story. This creativity for me is just knowing a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and just making new connections, reframing it, you know, rewiring it mm -hmm. into a new whole. Because I don't think there's that many stories to tell. I mean, there's the human condition. We have the human condition. We live in this body on this planet. Mm -hmm. You know, our essence is duality. And, but, and we all, you know, live our hero's journey in our own way. Mm -hmm. And there's the basic archetypes and the archetypal hero's journey but how do you tell it you know what are the what are the characters and what flavor do they have and mm -hmm. you know and, and and playing with that so um i guess it grew over time and as i became more interested in it and i've read a lot of psychology and 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 books about archetypes and and self-development and self-mastery and that sort of like brought me into new insights into telling stories and communicating and being on stage and giving talks and speeches um but i guess it was always somehow there you know the internal call to reach out and connect yeah so it sounds like you i mean you could have gone any route as that storyteller from poetry to speaking to anything how do you end up working with a, a convention center a, a zoo was it the animals that brought you there was it the connecting that you just talked about what brought you to uh, a room with a zoo 
oh, damn, my path is such an irreverent one. It wasn't just, a, you know, it wasn't a straight upward journey. If you look back, it doesn't make any freaking sense. Uh, <laughs> Those are the best. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense to me. But I guess being a little bit older and having read a little bit and having done a little bit work on myself, I can come to the point that actually I've sort of walked a philosopher's journey, the journey of, um, living closer to what matters and finding out what that is to me, being as authentic as I can be, uh, trying to, you know, bring in as much love as I can and give and receive as much love as I can. But I guess, I guess the red threat was seeing, I guess, potential in things. So I've gone from working from a sort of pharmaceutical company. I've worked for Coca-Cola in Holland. I've worked for Coca-Cola in headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia, to coming back to my own country in Belgium where I'm born and raised and ending up in the zoo. And I could make all sorts of like smart remarks around that, but actually basically the, 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 the choices that I've made um, were built on two things. Um, I guess um, rationally, I am enamored with potential. Mm -hmm. uh, potential in things, in brands, in companies, in services, potential. And I am a woman, so in the end, I make intuitive choices, mm -hmm. and they don't always make sense, uh, unless you're 10 years later and you see how things were connected. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I wanted to become an actress when I was 15 years old, but there's no market for actresses, you know, in my country at that time. And uh, so I studied law, I did something completely different, and I've been miserable for years on end, trying to find my way. Hmm. But through making choices and, 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 and trying to be as authentic as I could in a different way than what I kind of felt intuitively was my path, there you are so many years later, even a couple of decades later, and all the pieces falling together into a puzzle and I'm doing everything that I ever wanted to do, which is travel, tell stories, being on stage, inspiring people and helping people to bring them closer to what matters, whatever that is for them. Mm. And so, yes, it wasn't a rational choice, but maybe the rational choices may never have brought me to where I am now. And I do work with actors now and I get to be their uh, ambassador and be their supporter and be their fan uh, and appreciate them and nurture them by in my position as a chief commercial officer of this company that also has a concert hall, but that produces so I produced a musical last year for our anniversary, oh, wow. um, telling our story in a different way. So when we talk about platforms and how stories in this day and age can take on so many forms, it's not just books anymore, but you know, we'll live all a couple of decades already. If we've been living in the experience economy or the experience economy with meaning now and mm. to be able to do that and find formats that are, the best formats for the different stories and the different chapters and the different dimensions that we have is such a blessing. But I couldn't have figured it out 20 years ago. And I've had a couple of miserable years in between. So how did I end up here? Yes, just by living my life and sometimes having incredible setbacks and overcoming them mm -hmm. and not having a you know straightforward career path or doing this and then that, but living as authentically as I could and trying to become a better me every day um, with an open mind. And hmm. so I hear a lot of self-awareness and self-discovery in that, just being ready to, you know, we grow in those valleys, we grow in our challenges, I know that, but then just being aware of that and continuously learning, that's what I hear a lot from your journey. So that's, that's very interesting, Anya. Yes. Do you... Do you look back now and say, okay, uh, so you mentioned you worked for Coca-Cola, you worked for a, a big pharmaceutical, and now you're working with, with uh, a zoo, essentially. What a, what a difference that must be. How, how does that feel? You know, because you almost think like as a marketer, so I, I'm a marketer, and I almost feel like, gosh, if I worked for Coke, that'd be like it, right? That'd be the, the biggest stage to be on. But in reality, you're doing so much amazing work there. How do you see the difference between those two? parts of your career there's a huge difference of course and i learned it was such a parallel between my personal life and my professional life and what i needed to learn personally and how i could infuse it into my professional life and vice versa so for me on my journey it was really important to understand that more isn't always better 
And that lesson came across with a very, very tough divorce. You know, I lived in the States, I was married to an American, and there I am, long story short, uh, at almost 40 years old with a two-year-old as a single mom coming back to my country. Mm -hmm. So American dream turned nightmare for me. And so for me, yes, being living life in a fast lane and having a fast career track, being faced with who am I and what choices am I going to make? And um, realizing and, and, and living the journey from within at that point in time, being almost like forced from a calling within to make a different choice and, and finding along the way that working in a company that is like, you know, so small and, and, and local and so different from the big Coca-Cola with the big brands and the big budgets and the multinational platform, um, I had the blessing of, at that time, of having almost like, a, uh, as we say, a blank check to do what I wanted. So I could infuse everything that I learned. And I'm really, really don't read, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm so grateful for the lessons learned. I'm grateful for every employer I had. I'm very grateful for Coca-Cola and the bosses I had because I learned branding. I learned about marketing. I learned how to look at the world. I looked, especially in headquarters in Coca-Cola where I worked at new brands, of how to look at trends and interpret them and making that translation into a relevance for your own and then translate them back into a relevance for the audience. So I learned so much. But there I could give back. And when you're in pain and when you have so many needs because you're in such sorrow and you're heartbroken, I've learned that the best way to get out of it in gratitude is to start giving, to start giving what you need. And that's what I started doing. So I needed to make a radical different choice. I needed to learn radical forgiveness for myself to overcome the shame and the guilt and the, you know, so many of those intense feelings that we all been through when we go through divorce or heartbreak and radical self love and, you know, and give yourself that permission to love again mm -hmm. and infuse all those emotions and that growth into your job. It's such a, you know, you can't, you can't leave yourself at home and go to your workplace. I don't believe in that. Um, the best me I bring to work and I inspire my people because of the journey that I've lived. And by making different choices, I could really infuse everything that rationally I learned at Coca-Cola, but live from within. And um, yes, it is very different. And at the same time, after seven years working on a very local level and, and, and leading a complete transformation of an institute that was uh, dull and needed a, a complete um, reincarnation. Um, I had again the, the blessing of having this challenge of launching this new convention center internationally because the zoo is nationally known, it's a national treasure. The concert hall is a national treasure. But to build an international convention center around it and the city not being that much known as a convention destination place, I had a new challenge after so many years and all of a sudden I could, all of a sudden I had an international stage again. <laughs> so the locality, which, yeah, at a certain moment, I do admit four or five years ago became really sort of like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, I find my way as a single mom with my girl and you know, you become stronger again and you grow and I felt I needed something more and you know, the universe responded and there I got a gift of the international convention center. And so, yes, now it's just like, everybody says, how did you ever find a job like that? <laughs> uh, and I think it was sort of like also sort of created because you know, who gets to do, you know, um, promote conventions and, and do programming of a concert hall and produce musicals and theater plays and, yeah. and write books and, and do radio shows and we do TV shows and, and we're going to make movies and we have a foundation and we have scientific research and, and there's education and there's so much. Uh, and I couldn't have, Dan, I couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined it. I couldn't have figured it out. It's just living life from within, I guess, and being as authentic as you can with all the bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's interesting. you talked about balance. You can't leave yourself at home and go to your work. And, and it's funny because there's so many, things out there in the world from books to podcasts talking about a work life balance. And I always find that interesting. I don't, I don't believe in a balance. I believe in just living like you, like you said, Anya, your authentic self, um, be able to leave work at work sometimes, but also if you love your work, which clearly you do, um, you kind of probably aren't ever done with it. And while you're at work, it's nice to be able to think about your, your outside of work life. And so 
I like that balance side of it. That's very, that's very deep. Yeah, I've also, I'm really passionate about the yin yang and the whole fem femininity that we talk about so much now. It's the age of the feminine and, and bringing, you know, the female more into the workplace and just the feminine more into our business life. Mm -hmm. And thinking about so much of our self development and, and business um, teachings and process and procedures and principles are very male oriented. Mm -hmm. And if you think about um, a, a female's balance, we have cycles. We cycle with the moon. Mm -hmm. And we have ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And there is no balance. I mean, there is balance if you look at a long term. We have winter and summer. And we have ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, ebb and flow. And we have, so, and in work for me, it's like that. And I think when you're an artist, which you are, I think when you're a storyteller and you're craving to build those connections, it's not about being in balance every day. I think it's maybe being from a balanced self within, creating whatever it is that needs to be created. And it means sometimes no sleep. And it means sometimes within, you know, traveling and, and, and building connections to people, you know, dancing until three in the morning and sleeping three hours, which I do when I go to conventions, because that's what matters at that point is life connections. And it's not about, oh, I need to be in balance, so I'm going to go to sleep at 10 o'clock. Well, I might do that when I come back home. But if you look at that, it doesn't look very balanced because it goes very much up and I'm all extrovert and I'm traveling and I'm not sleeping much and I'm, you know, doing that. And then I have to recharge. But looking at from a distance, it's kind of balanced. Yeah. To be out of balance for love and to do the things you love, I think that's part of leading a balanced life. To be out of balance for love. That's, uh, yeah, well said. What's it like telling, being a storyteller on that international stage? I mean, if, as you took this convention center international, do you have to understand story in different cultures, the story crossed those boundaries pretty easily. How, how is that? Um, I do find when you dig deep and you tell a story authentically from your strengths, you think a bit about reframing it to the audience, but not too much. I tend to reframe my stories um, only in a way that I would maybe uh, start differently and differently, come back to the beginning uh, that may tap into some local or cultural thing. But the story is a story. And if you have a strong story, as I said in the beginning, it taps into the archetypes and in the ar archetypal realities, which are in the unconscious, you know, universalities of being alive and being human, the human mm -hmm. condition, which I think cross boundaries is exactly, I think, the power of stories. Humor is different. Humor is very local mm -hmm. and very culturally bound. There may be some um, cultural uh, etiquettes around presenting yourself, being a little bit more formal or maybe a dress code here and there. But I tend to find that universal stories step into universal the universal human condition universal emotions which is exactly what archetypes are which is why i mean if you look at harry potter which is my all-time favorite story <laughs> that's what that is she tapped in so many archetypes in so many elements of the human condition that are relevant today that they sell that they resonate in every culture mm. across boundaries across religion so yes i do think the most powerful stories cross boundaries. That's exactly what stories do because they tap into emotions that are just universal. Yeah. Uh, yes. Harry Potter is big in our house as well. So <laughs> we, uh, we are big fans here. Um, so, so you love connecting, you love inspiring, you love from the stage. Uh, that's what I take away from what, that what you love about storytelling. What's one of your biggest challenges when it comes to storytelling? Um, I think the challenges that, um, one faces is to um, not being caught up too much in your own story, remain fresh and authentic that when you've told it over and over again, to really, um, I mean, the story is a story. I mean, from a room with the, from a room with the zoo. If you tell a different story or different an angles of making it, as, again, that authenticity of not becoming trivial, 
um, and then tapping it into uh, or, or formatting into a format that um, is tailored to the format that you're at. You know, sometimes it's the 10 minutes you get, it's the 20 minutes you get, it's the 30 minutes you get. Sometimes the platform is different. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the challenges is to get um, the attention of the people, you know, to really keep that, 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 um, that vibe of attention and engagement alive. I think that's one of the biggest, that, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges because in the end they say that we're storytellers and we're, we're putting so much attention on words and then you know, oh, well, people only remember 20% of what you said. They remember the energy. They remember how you made them feel. And you know, they may remember the subject of your story. They may not remember you. Well, when they do remember both, then you've really sort of like, wow. Um, it gives you the relativity, but it also challenges you constantly of being as authentic as you can. Because when you're sort of like putting on a show and you're getting lost in your words, you're not transferring that authentic energy anymore and you'll lose them. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, a constant, um, uh, challenge. Yeah. And how do you tackle that challenge just through practice through again, that self-awareness and learning? Um, yes, I guess it's, um, it's, it's a continuous journey of remaining, of, of, of remaining, um, uh, open of rem remaining in a growth mindset of not thinking, Oh, I've made it. I just nailed it. You know, I've just won an award and I pitched to 1200 people live, you know, you know, yeah. it's every day. You're only as good as your last story. You're only as good as, as good as your last performance singers say, I think it's a little bit the same with us storytellers. Um, you're only as good as your last campaign or whatever, just meaning remain open. Every day is fresh. Every day is a new challenge to give your best, to push yourself to the next limit and to not remaining in that complacency. Um, and I think that's the preparation that I, um, that I constantly um, give myself. I will push myself to a boundary that, to the next boundary. For instance, now I'm not going to go on stage with notes at all. I'm, or, you know, you start with having a text then it's only headlines, then it's just keywords. And so you can always find ways to push yourself to the next level, but also to remain in a sort of like zone of discomfort, not discomfort that makes you nervous, but discomfort in a way that pushes you to giving you, of giving yourself, of being vulnerable, of being open, which I think is, is my challenge or what I, how to, how I try to prepare. Yeah. So I want to go back to what you said earlier about uh, the different platforms that the uh, convention center uses. You know, you've, you've talked about movie, you know, a foundation, uh, musical, the writing, you've been interviewed, you speak from the stage. When we have a story today, whether it's a brand, whether it's our personal story, how are we supposed to get out there? Is it through those multi-platforms? Is it a particular place that you start? Is social media still good? Like how would you suggest a storyteller get their story out today? It really depends on the kind of story you want to tell. I think some um, stories would find their way better through Instagram, others through post podcasts. Um, as I said, a story doesn't necessarily need to have a lot of words either. So it really depends on that. However, having said that in terms of the real starting point, I do think today you need to be multi-platform. I think social media are a blessing for many storytellers out there with a low budget. It is a, uh, uh, platform that allows so many smaller players to get their story out there. So it's a, it's a huge blessing. At the same time, I do think one needs to look at making their story, of course, as I talked about authenticity, but also about experiences. When you can, to make your story into an experience, you know, to look at that, to be aware of the attention span of people. Um, the social media, what they have given us, even though we curse them sometimes because the attention span of the younger generation decreases, decreases, decreases. Even political campaigns are being formed in bumper stickers with all the consequences. But it has forced us, especially us marketeers, to go to the essence of things. 
because people don't put up with the bullshit anymore because they don't have the time. They right. don't have the attention span. So it really forces you to go to the essence, to not just be window dressing and being, you know, wallpaper, um, to really contribute, to, to really drill down and to make sure that you find that nugget, that golden egg that makes a difference, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, and to... Um, and to make sure that you're of value. And that's what social media with all the short attention spans do. Yet at the same time, it's very hard to reach people and to get out there. So it's a way of remaining authentic, finding what your authentic swing is. I love legend that the legend of beggar vans. I don't know if you know the movie. Mm -hmm. It's like just, you know, it's just like, I <laughs> love that. You know, the metaphor of golf is a sport, which is, it's not about golf. It's about life. Everybody has their authentic swing, which is, you know, what we marketeers do about ourselves you know what is our narrative our story what is our authentics when you only have one um what is our purpose our contribution that's what that is we do the same with our brands with our services with our products so to really drill down on that and take your time to really be clear and then just use whatever you have and then depending on those stories see what the best platform is and sometimes it even might be taking it offline and telling you a story among families, among friends, on doing sitcoms at home, doing podcasts, doing something in your local theater, you know, because I do believe with working in the, in the, con in the world of Congresses and international Congresses, you know, it's a little thing for, for storytellers. So there's this digital world that allows you to consume the best content in the world from the comfort of your sofa, right? With a very good ecological footprint. So why meet life? Why people from all across the world with a disastrous ecological footprint, right? So to meet physically at one particular place with people from across the globe needs to be redefined. You can't put people in a bunker with air conditioning and, and, and bad food and no daylight. It doesn't make any sense nowadays. And, but the value of life is more important than ever in the digital world. Mm. And that is when you have that human connection where you can look each other into the eyes. So I do think for storytellers, what it is in a book and you really transport people into a different universe and you can have them disengage from their locality and make them engage in another world is of phenomenal value. But also to do that life in whatever form, I think is going to be of incredible value in this world of technology to rekindle that human connection, mm -hmm. you know, that human condition that we share um, is going to be of incredible value. So I think it's going to increase besides the bit size, comfortable, you know, social media and all of that, that helps us get the story out there and build a following to think about doing things live and connecting human to human. I really do believe mm -hmm. that in this digital age, there's going to be both. There's, there's, there's going to be, but you're going to have to be good in each. You know, the middle ground is sort of going to disappear. But storytellers who are able to stand on stage or just in a living room and enthrall people and engage them and make them feel human, you know, and engage that heart. And that's, that's, that's of incredible value, I think, mm -hmm. in the future. It's just the way I look at, 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 at our craft and, and our future. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been seeing this kind of, come to the surface in the last few months here as I talk to people and I, I think about things like this, what you said, Anya, about the, in the digital age, that human connection, that, that relationship is still so important. You know, in this age of Siri and Alexa and everything else that we have, actually serving people and connecting and empathy, right? You know, AI is great for a lot of things, but it can't give us empathy. Not really. Um, yeah, I think, I think empathy and, is a big part of it. With AI and again, technology, I'm not bashing on technology at all. Technology gives, you, gives us so much. Mm -hmm. But both have their reality and have their value. And I think in this age of, of depression, burnout, loneliness, you know, in big cities, one of the biggest challenges is the loneliness. And loneliness does not have any age, face, religion, race, whatever. It is of all people. Mm. And, you know, the, 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 the hunger for real community, the hunger for human connection, that's what Harry Potter has as well. You know, it's this ordinary guy that all of a sudden becomes extraordinary. It's about this human potential that is larger than anything we could ever imagine. It's about friendship. It's about, 
you know, it's about a community of wizards and, and non-wizards. And, and it's about going beyond yourself, not because you're here on your own, but because you're facil facilitated with friends. And I think there's so much in there that people are craving for, that people need this day, the true authentic human connection to really, you know, be vulnerable in the presence of one another, to build those bridges of humanity next to the technological uh, uh, realities and facilitation. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. What a mic drop moment. What a way to go out. I love that. I love it. I, I just want to get on a plane and come to Belgium and, have have tea with you and show me around the convention center i just i'm so grateful for this time um no, before any well i'll keep that in mind my wife and i actually want to travel to ireland in the next few years and then i'm like i want to travel to europe i just want to because i feel like i could just drive around like i could through states in the u.s just just drive around so yes. or take uh, the train you can even see words and you know take the train around so yes, yeah there you it's go very easy. easy traveling for europe yeah. That's awesome. Now, before I get to my last question, Anya, I want to make sure everybody can connect with you. Where do you send people to connect with you and with the convention center? Um, you mean in terms of, uh, um, like a web, like a website or, or do you do, oh, yeah. okay. I mean, you're on Twitter. So I know. Have, yeah, we have the, we have a room with a zoo. We have a room with a zoo, Twitter. We had a Facebook, we have an Instagram. If you look at room with a zoo, or you look at Zoo Antwerp, you will find us on every basically social yeah. Um, platform. Yes. Excellent. And you're out there too. So people can connect with, with you, Anya. And uh, I suggest they do. I'll put links in the show notes. Um, so if, if someone were to say to you tomorrow, Anya, you can no longer be a storyteller, find something else to go do. What would be your last story that you'd want to leave people with? The last story would be a story of love because that's the, the, the most important of all. And it would be a story about um, telling people to live fully and openly uh, as much as they can, to have an open mind. I think a growth mindset is incredibly important uh, to develop one's talent, to find your authentic swing and to share it with the world and do it in kindness mm. and to do it with wisdom and to do it with beauty as much as you can. That's the story it would be. That's a good one. Good one to leave people with for sure. Anya, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you being on the Storytellers Network. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, Dan. And good luck with the show. Well, I hope you enjoy that as much as I enjoyed talking with Anya. Thank you so much, Anya Stas. You can connect with her at the links in the show notes, like she mentioned, and more. So do that and check out the, uh, the convention center. Now, if you enjoyed the episode and got something out of it, please consider sharing it anywhere you can, whether it's that social media that Anya mentioned, whether it's email, just telling somebody. Really appreciate you sharing that for us to, to build the Storytellers Network with some amazing listeners just like you. And, uh, and if you really enjoyed it, feel free to leave a, a review too, a rating and, and a review over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. So appreciate that very much. Uh, and you can also connect with me on the storytellersnetwork.com. Go to contact Dan. You can hit that button to contact me. You can also uh, subscribe via email on the storytellersnetwork.com so that you get uh, twice a month an email in your inbox with the latest episodes and even some throwback stuff and some personal stuff. So there you go. Uh, so do as all at the storytellersnetwork.com. Thank you for listening today. I appreciate it very much. Until next time, here's to telling our stories, having those stories to tell. Cheers.